everyone. Um, we're facing a really interesting conversation um, about platform challenges and solutions currently on the market. We're going to be speaking to um, some really interesting people um, about how they've tackled their, uh, um, their own solutions to platform design. Um, we are, I think, at an age, we've moved past the age where the platform is uh, uh, be all and end all to any gaming operating business. It is the heart and soul. And whereas if we roll back maybe uh, 10, as little as 10 years ago, um, uh, the, the age of proprietary platforms has been to an extent replaced um, with really good B2B uh, platform providers and, and, and managed solutions. Um, I mean, uh, I, th I think it's fair to just go back a ways and take a look at where the industry has gone. I mean, it's only what, uh, about 20 years old um, and, and um, somewhere halfway to a point, right? Looking a decade or so ago, uh, we started hearing about seamless wallets, right? We started seeming about, uh, hearing about hey, I can actually just control the player and control the player's wallet. And then what I'll do is I'll plug in all the remaining services, my games, my sports book, and so on. So, so I want to talk about that element um, of, of wallet control, of player management control, that integral part. And for that, we have Tim Wallace. Uh, he's the group architect of Every Matrix. Every Matrix has been around for a very long time. Uh, they're, they're a very prominent platform on the market. We have uh, George Shamuja. Is, did I say that right? Shamu, Shamuja? Yep. Yeah. Um, CEO of Singular. Uh, very interesting te technology. I've, I've been speaking to George for a while and, and I'm really keen for, for them to uh, open up a little bit about their architecture. And we have Ricardo Ruiz, who is the chief technical officer of Video Slots. Now, Video Slots in particular, uh, in contrast to every matrix and, and singular, um, runs a proprietary software, a platform of their own design that only caters to their operation. So I wanted to um, uh, speak to you guys about the dynamic of what uh, building a platform and or, and or purchasing a platform entails. Right. Um, I'd like an opening take from the three of you on the key elements that an operator should be looking at when purchasing or building a platform, right? Um, still from, even though we're a deep tech summit, I think product and tech go hand in hand. So from choosing the solution, um, what is it that are primary challenges and things that we simply must ensure that we resolve um, in order to choose the right platform or build one, right? Um, any one of you can open this topic up. I think it's a hot rock. Anyone? Uh, I guess I'll start. Mm -hmm. uh, so, just to give you kind of like the background, uh, the, it was kind of end of 2013 when we first launched our kind of actual uh, platform in production. And ever since, we had kind of actual different uh, kind of clients uh, from startups to the tier ones. And uh, for the last couple of years, it's mostly been tier ones across the kind of world in different kind of jurisdictions. And uh, so far, what we have observed actually when it comes to actually building the platform and what should operators should be looking into the platform, first, definitely, it's, uh, it is kind of scalability. Uh, because once you grow, then scalability issues going to raise. And uh, everyone can agree here that we've seen some platform uh, platforms uh, across the industry who faced kind of actually uh, scalability issues once they, uh, the operators pass the kind of actually startup kind of actually stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, uh, I guess comes kind of actually uh, platform being open, especially if you're making a B2B kind of deal, the platform should uh, provide uh, sort of kind of, let's call it kind of open APIs. It should be extensible. Because I don't uh, believe in that it's kind of possible to build the one platform that's going to serve all the kind of actual business cases out there, all the all sorts of jurisdictions, and also taking into the consideration that new markets getting regulated with different kind of requirements. It's almost impossible to have the platform that serves everyone. But mm -hmm. if the platform is designed in a manner that's extensible, it's kind of provides open APIs, and uh, uh, either the platform provider itself can add and build upon the kind of services as a plug and play kind of actual solutions, or even give the, in some occasions uh, kind of to the operators the ability 
build the extensions by themselves, which is kind of actually pretty frequent kind of case, especially with the tier ones. Uh, then more or less the kind of uh, everything is kind of actually in order. So if you got the platform that's scalable uh, and if you got the platform that's kind of uh, uh, extensible and provides the open APIs, mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, actually uh, kind of pretty much it. That's the kind of core essence of it. Because that means that you're kind of on the safe side. You know that it doesn't matter how fast you're going to grow, the platform going to cope with that. It won't go down. You're, you won't have downtime, so you won't lose the business. And at the same time, you know that whatever you're getting, you're getting the also kind of actual extensible platform, which means that even if the provider is not kind of actual platform provider is not able to deliver something on time because they have mm -hmm. their own schedule for sure and the milestones, you know that you got the APIs, which is well documented and the kind of petrol tested on mm -hmm. the market, then you can get teams small or big and even you by yourself operator can extend the service and serve your purpose whatever you have on your hands. It's, it's actually something that I've experienced personally myself as we were developing Casino. So, so we were using third-party platforms which we helped co-develop. And at, at some point in time, we, we simply needed the ability to create certain solutions on the front end ourselves and simply inject bonus uh, rewards or inject or, 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 or query SQL from, from some elements. Yep. And I think that's quite an important aspect, as you said, the, the, the versatility of the yeah, API Yeah, total, totally agree. Just to give you a kind of quick example from our uh, personal kind of experience. So to take just one of the our one, uh, tier one clients, Acharavid, which was being acquired by Flutter Group. So initially they used our kind of actually website solution as well, which is kind of totally decoupled from our core platform. It's a standalone service and uses kind of our open APIs. Uh, it was pretty good for them, but once they grow and they be, uh, kind of actually reached the, uh, became the multi-jurisdiction kind of operator, mm -hmm. they had their own challenges. They had their own ideas, uh, what they wanted to try, test uh, and explore. So they actually uh, created the internal kind of actual website development team and mm -hmm. just using the same APIs we used for our kind of website, they built kind of actually the whole kind of pseudo kind of solutions, the website itself, mobile website, some bonuses, some kind of complementary games, which uh, which is not kind of real money gaming, but uh, serves as the kind of bonuses that the games that where you can play your free bets or so on. And uh, during kind of uh, course of last few years, uh, what they achieved with this kind of approach, that's kind of phenomenal. And uh, even just to give you kind of one of the example, one of the markets they are, uh, entered was the kind of Armenia, which was spread up, uh, dominated by the kind of local players. And uh, whoever tried before to enter, even from some, uh, some other operators that market, didn't have kind of much of a success, especially considering the market is not very really huge. But just taking that approach, just extending the platform and only doing the part that kind of actually um, uh, kind of delivers the kind of actually, uh, let's say, a result in terms of the kind of actual marketing or the uh, user acquisition, just kind of changing those kind of bits of pieces and extending just that part. Uh, in just a couple of years' time, uh, they can actually well, yeah. already acquired almost 45% of the market share. Wow. So I and this is not just the, uh, the only them. We've seen the same situation with other kind of our clients as well. So, so uh, I mean that, that that sounds quite quite incredible in terms of the direction that you've taken. Singular, I I, I want to see uh, a comparison between what what uh, Ricardo from an um, proprietary platform element um, would consider uh, key aspects of as you were building the platform and as you are looking at you as a unit, right? As, a, uh, as opposed to every matrix or as opposed to singular, effectively you, you don't have to look at other clients, you don't have to look at um, and, and take your approaches B2B, right? Uh, from an operator perspective that started on their own and developed this um, and is continuing to grow on, on your own, um, what are the integral parts of what you focus on in terms of building and, uh, and what, what lessons have you learned to this point in time in terms of what you're delivering? So in, in general, like uh, George said, uh, we also look into scalability, of course, because I mean, uh, and any other aspect that he mentioned, we also look into that because uh, even if it's in house, our company is our client. So it's like, and it's on our only client. So it's like we, we, we build it like 
uh, everything. Mm. Like we are working as B two B in reality. Yes. we're building our platform. But I mean, okay, scalability is one point, right? Sc scalability, of course, um, the, we're going to open this box. And in fact, I want to open this box in terms of scalability architecture, especially when we're looking at um, the scalability demands on uh, different product verticals. Because your scalability demand on the casino product vertical is not the same as the scalability demand of the sportsbook product vertical. Right, exactly. Because of the number and of the number of transactions, and the, the you know the one has consistent transactions here, the other one has peak and drop times. So so, but besides the scalability, which as an architecture we need to focus on, wouldn't you consider the the flow of integrations as the market moves, as your customers move, and as the customers demand products, right? Um, if if you look at the dependency, if if we break this down per product vertical and you look at the casino dependency, your uh, product placements are moved by the dictations of the market. So if one of the suppliers becomes the prominent supplier in a region that you're uh, active in, right? Um, tomorrow, it could be, uh, it doesn't matter, uh, pragmatic play, it could be uh, Yedrasil, it could be, right? A any, we've seen op um, uh, suppliers rise up and be demanded by customers. That kind of journey flow. That kind of ability for quick integration to be ahead of the market curve, even, even something as simple as making sure that the games when they're launched are on your site straight away. Um, is that not one of the caring elements of, wha of, of, um, of, of what, what you focus on? Yeah, that's one of the caring elements, but uh, I was, uh, when I mentioned what I mentioned about the scalability is, yes, I was saying that uh, from our perspective, we, we work as a B2B in that sense. But uh, for us, what you're asking would be like uh, the second most important part. Yeah. The most important part for us, it's been like, uh, and we realized about that like uh, three years ago, mm. and it's our focus is regulation. So yeah. that is the most important part for us. Because there is when, when, where you need to be agile. I mean, mm -hmm. you have like a game supplier that is becoming like very popular, like you said. Mm -hmm. So you can, um, even commercially, you can decide not to implement that game supplier. Uh, when yeah. it comes to regulation, you cannot choose. This, there is no way you can choose. So uh, there is where you need to be fast. There is where your so platform needs to adapt. Absolutely, and I have a really, I have a really uh, interesting question to tag along here in terms of agility and in terms of ability to adapt, related to COVID itself, related to this time and age, right? I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna direct this to Tim, but at one point in time, we carry massive. Pro I mean, every matrix has historically been. I mean, you started with odds, odds matrix. I remember that. I remember Stian kicking off. Every I actually remember Stian <laughs> sitting in my office. I had a tiny office in Slema, and we we're chatting about the bonusing engine. I mean, I, I think every matrix was at concept stages at that point in time, or he had just started. Um, I mean, o odds matrix carried every matrix, right? I mean, it's fair to say that, and we're very sports book centric. And all of a sudden, sports around the world goes gone. Absolutely, right? right? Just dead air. Right? I mean, I, I, I'm certain uh, that, I mean, from, from Video Slot's perspective, you're singing because let's play casino now. But, but from, from a perspective of B2B suppliers, some of your clients have literally ended up dead in the water if they were pre pre predominantly, predominantly sportsbook centric. The ability of a supplier to introduce something like esports and swap the product, um, that agile development, I would argue is one of the key elements of, of actually choosing um, the correct pa pa uh, platform partner and or um, when building the infrastructure um, of the proprietary platform, ensuring that that kind of agility is present, right? Absolutely. And to my mind, this is, you know, I consider this scalability, but it's also, uh, and, you know, I'm a techie, so I look at the technical architecture, mm. but scalability of the organization is also part of that architecture. And Absolutely. that means the ability to scale up the number of vendors that you're offering to rapidly integrate new vendors to uh, rapidly pivot what you're doing. You know, you're right. The, the, the sports business was very heavily hit um, by COVID. Mm -hmm. we, we, we had to handle two scalability issues as a result of that. You know, mm -hmm. First of all, 
um, we had massive growth in casino volumes, um, sure. as, as, as I'm sure everybody uh, is also familiar with that particular challenge in the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, but we then needed to be able to respond from a product point of view as well. So that means integrating new vendors, um, integrating uh, esports, new markets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and those are the sorts of things which um, I think if you, uh, that's one of the advantages of working with a B2B provider. Um, we have to deal with hundreds uh, of vendors on a, on a regular basis um, anyway. So for us, that was a pivot. Uh, it took a lot of hard work, but it was one that we were able to make um, pretty quickly. We already have relationships with the right suppliers. We already have gaming integration teams who are dedicated to that. So we're able to do that. And I think that's um, that's an aspect of scalability in a B2B provider that, that you are also looking for. It's not just about technical scalability. Yeah. It's also about, um, you know, we're doing other jobs up. for you, relationships with vendors, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also taking that load away from the operator. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have, or unfortunate, depending on your perspective, to have been uh, in this business for 20 years now. Um, And 20 years ago, there were realistically no platform providers. So we were building everything ourselves. And now I look back on that, you know, I built a credit card processing platform (laughs) just to process, uh, you know, with with X25 connections to the bank. I wouldn't yeah. dream of doing that now. You know, yeah, I would no, simply go to a PSP. It, exactly. It would be crazy. Uh, one of 15,000 of them out there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, um, you know, one, one of the things exactly. that you want to look for is how do I differentiate my business? Is it, uh, you know, do my customers think that I have the best payment processing system under the bonnet in the world? No. Mm-hmm. I mean, the customers don't even want to know that I have a payment processing mm-hmm. system. They just want to put the money in and magically it appears in their account. So that's, that's somewhere where I'm going to go to a B2B. But I want to innovate my front end. I want to innovate elsewhere. And that really goes back to what George was talking about APIs. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to do your development where you can innovate and, and be unique in the marketplace. And you want someone else to handle 100 different vendor relationships to be able to do yeah. Uh, a switch to esports um, overnight because because the real world has changed. In, in fact, I mean, I, I've extracted three things from this uh, simple uh, discussion we had so far. I mean, I think the the versatility of the API is understated, um, and I think it's only r- recently, uh, as as operators gained experience and traction and a need to engage customers, need to build more, more immersive front ends, uh, ability to uh, give bonuses in real time, ability, e- even the introduction of AI in terms of customer engagement started um, developing a need for, for that front end back end integration, right? Which, which front end, uh, when I say front end, I assume front end controlled by the operator themselves, that's the house, that's, that's their shop front. And the platform there as a robust, scalable, transactional event-driven system that drives that machinery forward, right? Um, I, I think that the, the versatility of the a- API uh, today is understated and in immensely important uh, considering how competitive the industry is today. And that's one thing that I've extracted from this. Scalability, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm postponing that or moving it aside not to disregard it, but I want us to delve into the architecture, right? I want to use that to open the, the, the box of the architecture and the technology that drives scalable platform solutions. Um, so, so scalability is a, a, a second element, but one thing um, that drove me to query between Ricardo and you, in, in, and you to us, B2B platform providers, is that monolithic to modular approach, right? So, so even now as we're speaking, we're saying API versatility, right? Ability for the front end to do whatever the front end wants to do and complete segregation of the back end of the platform. Whereas we, if we look at the case study of video slots, you, you don't have that prerequisite. You don't have that necessity. Uh, I'm curious to find out whether you still find it beneficial to consider your internal business models as, as two segregated entities, front-end running on its own, um, back-end running on its own, or, or, or do you choose a more monolithic approach simply because you don't have that B2B element? Uh, in fact, like, we, like I said before, we like to 
think about architecture like we are a B2B provider. So everything in our side is modular. Uh, we have, I mean, our payment gateway, it's an API. It's a, it's an, still it's an internal API, but it's an API. I mean, you can resell it in yeah. tomorrow if you want it. Um, then, I mean, right now we're, we are working a lot with uh, GraphQL uh, and the communication between the front end and the back end because we believe that's kind of the future. Mm -hmm. And we are still like, I mean, everything we are doing right now new, it's done with that uh, modular approach in mind. So it's like we have our front end, even if it's our own front end, mm -hmm. it's, it's decoupled from the back end. And even inside our own backend, it's uh, there are like services that they are connected between each other. So it's a distributed architecture. It's not. So, uh, I mean, I think the three of you have a unified view. I mean, if we're speaking to the solution architects out there right yeah. now, um, and saying, "Hey, how do you build this?" Well, build it with microservices. Build it with a B two B approach. Work front end is front end, back office is back office, and make sure that the transactions are scal scalable. You know, if if I were to extract the message from 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 this. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, just to add kind of a little quick, so it's not just kind of in terms of the scalability, uh, but it also comes down to the kind of when you're building the platform. If everything is kind of decoupled, that means that you can have multiple development streams and teams won't kind of rely on each other. So it just simplifies the software development lifecycle as well. So it's not just that, okay, my platform is kind of scalable, it can handle billions of transactions, mm -hmm. but it also kind of actually simplifies the whole development cycle internally as well, which actually at the end day that kind of all the businesses are looking for as well, just to kind of optimize your kind of actual yeah. internal life cycles as well. M modularity makes it, life a lot easier in terms of delivering a product. You know, I know my limitations, and if, yeah. if someone gave yeah. me the spec for the entire platform, in, 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 I know I couldn't deliver that. Yeah. If you break that down into deliverable units, yeah. life is much easier. And, and I think commercially as well, uh, I think George would probably agree that I, I've at least seen this change happening over, let's say, the last five years, that really we are moving more towards systems integrators than software developers. Clients are coming Absolutely. to us. They already have components from X, from yeah, Y, exactly. um, and, and and that is so much easier if you if your system is already modular and integrated. In, in, yeah. in fact, um, one of, one of the sort of linking as I was thinking about this conversation, one of the linking elements between George and Singular, um, as as I was uh, researching Singular and as I was speaking to George, it's it's really um, conceptually modular approach to technology, and I really enjoyed a couple of chats that we had and how, how autonomous the areas of the platform are. So we spoke about, funny enough, I was speaking to, to uh, a commercial director of Singular, and we were chatting about um, uh, payments routing and acceptance rates, something that would sit outside of the platform. I mean, you, you can literally buy a service that improves acceptance rates and payments routing, but it was yeah. obviously the necessity of, of managing payments because you are so integ integral to the success of the operation, is also internalized. And then as I was chatting with that, I have to be honest with you, George, we were talking about this, and, and one of my, uh, my ex-head of payments, I, I, I mean, one of the best employees I've ever had, actually went to work for Paymatrix, right? Uh, and and I, I, it kind of dawned on me saying, not only have you modularized the platform, but if you take that throughout its historic hierarchy, you know, see where it goes, uh, you actually create independent business verticals from those pl platform modules, game aggregators, sports books, payment solutions, fraud, biometric solutions. And it's uh, amazingly, it's all consistent in, in one internal system, but it's actually entire business units. Yeah, totally going separate products, totally agree. Yeah, I, I, I think where we have I mean, if you, if you consider that this is the growth of just only a decade, it's pretty amazing how quickly it had morphed and developed. Right, um, it is deep tech. I mean, this is a great chat. I love chatting about platforms, I love chatting about product and concepts and so on, but architecture, guys, right? So a so couple of things I want to extract here, right? Why don't we see Oracle anymore? Why don't we see some microservices? I, I have answers to that. I want to hear your your thoughts, um, licensed. Is there, if I'm speaking tomorrow to a solution architect, either working 
in, a, in, a, in their firm and, and wanting to get rid of their current platform provider, speak to these two guys, or build uh, their own platform. Um, it, uh, is it worth going licensed? Is it worth looking at, at managed services? Um, has open source matured enough to, to implement this, right? I really want to uh, look at the examples of your architectures, if you don't mind uh, sharing that with me. Sure. Anyone can take this on. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, when it comes to actual license solutions, I would say uh, it totally depends on your business case. Uh, and there are some cases when it's actually pretty good solution mm -hmm. and you definitely should explore that way as well. Then when it comes actually to the kind of open source and just to do the kind of disclaimer, uh, our kind of whole kind of actual technology stack is open source. We don't have any single kind of license kind of uh, 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 software. So or what, this kind of, what kind of tech stack are you running? I, I'm uh, actually going to uh, compare just, you. Yeah, yeah, you know, just, sure. Just so the kind of actual call, kind of actual platform, the enterprise can actually logic and business logic is kind of built on a Java actually. Uh, it's uh, predominantly Java enterprise. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to the kind of actually database, kind of actually real-time database kind of storage, uh, we are using kind of actually subset of MySQL, which is kind of Perpona database. Uh, and when it comes to the kind of analytics, uh, analytics kind of database, uh, yeah, MySQL, MySQL is not kind of really good for that. So we went with the kind of click house, okay. uh, which is kind of actually a pretty new kind of wow. solution. Very but uh, it's kind of, yeah, uh, it's really amazing considering that even now with our kind of tier one clients, we are kind of actually doing the real time analytics on the 45 billion records and it just takes second or second and a wow. half. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's yeah, but, but I, that, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, with that kind of database structure, you can't really host multiple clients in, in single database structure. You kind of, you, you, you have to host them independently or, or am I wrong? Uh, is, is my comes, impression. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. When it comes to actually kind of hosting, uh, yeah, uh, you, actually you can host, but we are not doing that. So from the kind of actually beginning our one day, our kind of selling point was actually because we are mostly kind of serving the tier ones was that every single instance in the deployment is isolated and nothing is shared, not the kind of actual hardware resource cool. or the kind of database is shared. So that's what kind of tier ones are looking for. They want actually the, everything to be isolated and they want to be in control of the data. It's not just it's isolated, we're also giving the full access to the operators as well, them to have the kind of full visibility what's going on. Yeah, uh, but uh, also take, uh, uh, we have the cases when operators have multiple brands in multiple jurisdictions and they're using the kind of actual same instance. Uh, yeah. We have so-called kind of actually uh, domain segregation so mm -hmm. based on the kind of actual operator, the brand's domain or a jurisdiction, despite the fact the same instance is used, kind of actual data model is isolated on a kind of logical level, on the application level itself. Wow. Okay. So uh, it, I, uh, I have to, I have to the, control the flow because we're running out of time and I want to hit a couple yeah, other topics. Sure, sure. Um, Ricardo, I want to hear about your architecture because I haven't heard from you for a while and uh, I, I miss your voice and I want to see what... <laughs> what uh, video slots has approached and whether you're using. Um, I, I, I think all three of you are using open source. Mo most people I speak to these days, uh, it's just yeah. simply uh, a way to go. But I'm quite keen to see how, what you've built, how you've built it um, and why. And, and yeah. obviously the same from Tim. Uh, ours is uh, very straightforward. It's all the uh, PHP everywhere. Then so uh, we have Java, we, are... we have Java. Here, right? We have PHP there. Very yeah. interesting. All then right. we are, we are yeah. using MariaDB. That is a subset of MySQL as well. Yeah. Um, we are using a lot. We rely a lot on uh, Redis okay. um, as well as um, cache storage. And we also, it's something that we I, I found like we are like, it's not too many people using that. Uh -huh. We have our, we are on premise right now. So everything is managed Sorry. by us. On premise. Oh, okay. You're on premise. I mean, okay. So, yeah. So we build our own internal cloud with a LXE container that wow. are not okay. very used, like out out so, there. But I mean, they're... you mentioned my my, my database. Uh, in particular, video slots is one of the more immersive gamification experiences. Uh, Tim, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to get onto your architecture, mm -hmm. but there's 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 a side note. Video slots in particular, right, has always led the market. You had the battle of the slots. And you had uh, simply before anyone else. You've you've the tournaments and the sitting goes and the gimmicks, 
that happen on the site engage customers in near, near real time. I have seen that in the very early stages. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, how do you reconcile that need for real time engagement and for continuous data processing, right? All the aggregations, all the averages, all the pattern recognition. Um, uh, yesterday, we've spoken exactly about data processing, data management, and, and the demands on real time data. Um, with, with the architecture you have right now? D I mean, uh, right now our, uh, our architecture, I have to say, it's not that simple in terms of database. Mm -hmm. uh, we went uh, towards the path like a few years ago to shard the database. So we have a uh, partition, okay. our own database on a uh, application level. It's not done in the server okay. level. Yeah, okay. So I, I needed to reconcile the two because I know you're very real time engaged. So I was, I was wondering how, how that works. Yeah, because our answer. main focus is our response to a spin in a slot mm -hmm. has to be the fastest possible in the market. Absolutely. So if you want to achieve that, you, you, you have to, can't yeah. have like a monolithic database. You need no, like absolutely. a lot of instances. So everything is like a lighting file. Thanks for that. Tim. Um, well, gosh, I mean, so you, you asked the question about open source versus license, and I think we kind of all agreed that the, the really, I, I think the change has, has really been different. And I think two critical changes have influenced our architecture. And, and we are fortunate to have rebuilt almost all of our architecture in the last yeah. five years. Uh, I can say fortunate now at the time it was, uh, it was painful, but, um, but uh, the two really key things that, that, that I think have changed things are um, asynchronous uh, message-based architectures um, and automation. So George touched on one of the things that we're now doing a lot of, which is you know, multiple tenancy at the infrastructure level by using um, things like Kubernetes. Um, we, we, we've heavily, heavily bought into Kubernetes and orchestration, and then that allows us to sort of handle um, multiple installations for multiple operators on a single uh, single infrastructure platform so that that that's a huge benefit and that really i think changes the game of the single tenancy versus multi-tenancy model yeah obviously our platform was built to be multi-tenant but if you're moving into a world where deploying your platform is effectively executing a single cube control apply command yeah i, I don't mean to i don't mean to interject i'm sorry but you actually it, it dawned on me as every matrix historically have a massive pool of white labels right um and and now you've acquired various tier one companies and so on but if we look at the history of every matrix there's a tremendous yeah. pool what what kind of built you up i think it was the prom, probably the Absolutely. biggest white label driver of the industry for a number of years and and at at, at only one point was there a switch to, hey, let's do a B2B provision for some massive names in the industry. So, so actually that structure of shared uh, versus independent architecture, how, how, how do you reconcile that? So strategically, you're right. We, we, we changed focus away from, away from white label towards the, as I say, more of a system integrator type, uh, type position where, where uh, you know, our clients are now simply much larger. They have much yeah. more complex requirements than a simple sort of white, uh, white label turnkey. And yeah, absolutely, that shared platform um, position starts to change when, when you move into that area. Now, you know, everybody likes to benefit from economies of scale. Everybody likes the fact that they don't have to pay for the entire environment uh, because they're sharing it with someone else. Nobody wants someone else to possibly be able to affect their platform, on the other hand. And, and that's the tightrope that B2B platform providers have to have to walk down. Uh, and, and I think now we can do that at a virtual infrastructure level. That makes a whole lot of things possible that perhaps weren't five years ago. So really, it's Terraform, Ansible, Kubernetes, OpenShift, Open Nebula. These are the technologies that have that have totally changed things. Um, I would like to just mention databases as well, actually, because they've come up a bit. And um, yeah. um, you know, our traditional old platform is or was core database um, uh, based. But one of the things we've done. Is, is really sort of take the mantra that the best way to scale a database is to get rid of a database. Um, the best thing you can do, um, you know, at some point you need a database to record transactions. 
But there are a lot of intermediate databases that tend to creep in that if you step back and rethink the architecture and think in a message based kind of world yeah. uh, and an asynchronous world, you lose those databases and you help your scalability challenge enormously. So nowadays we have you know, Apache, Kafka, uh, that's yeah. where data is being stored in an intermediate state yeah. instead of being in, uh, in MySQL or PostgreSQL yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or an Oracle. Um, and and funny that's, enough, that's, I've, I was speaking to to gig yesterday, and and that was uh, uh, you, 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 I, I don't know if you've seen the chat, but uh, it, it was exactly that conversation where now we have to use Kafka, we have to use more uh, access access to uh, uh, faster data access. I'm sorry Absolutely, I'm and 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 you know we have to. Uh, and sometimes this means compromise with the business. You know, sometimes you have to say to the business and say, can we sort of rewrite your requirement in a little bit of a way so mm -hmm. that we can, you know, take advantage of eventual consistency? You know, the data will be uh, there. It'll be 200 milliseconds later, um, but it will all be there. Actually, yeah. that's your business requirement. So and I making that change, we can scale infinitely. I have a question for all of you, um, and I think we only have about five minutes left, um, so we kind of I have to start winding this down. As I said, I think at the beginning I said we can speak about this for hours. But there's an interesting concept for me. So, especially from the perspective of B two B supplier versus uh, an autonomous proprietary unit, Ricardo, I'm sorry I'm singling you out, but uh, nature of the beast, <laughs> my friend, nature of the beast. Um, two verticals I want a very brief uh, feedback on. First of all, dynamic segmentation and behavioral patterns, right? So, so looking at a B2B, B2B element to the platform provision, you simply learn from a larger data pool of customers, right? You're benchmarking. The benchmarking is simply uh, far more accessible than video slots or any one single operator operating from their ecosystem, closed ecosystem. Right? So when we look at customer behavior patterns, segmentation capabilities, uh, touching on machine learning, I don't want to do this as an AI talk. This is not what, what this talk is about, but it cannot be ignored. If, if we are to look toward the future, if we are look to, to, toward what we supply now, who we supply now, and where, 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 where the industry must go with the competitiveness as it stands today, preemptive behavior analytics are definitively the next stage that we have to enter into. We are there already. So, so um, comparative as, as B2B suppliers, uh, having access to a number of operators and the way they operate, their own knowledge and understanding. Uh, do you set some generic benchmark across the board? Are you even capable of doing that in terms of you know, data accessibility and whatnot um, in order to to um, introduce preemptive customer behavior. That's the first kind of question I have for the three of you, brief answers. And the second, uh, second one is um, reactive design. What you've just touched on, accessibility of data and the speed of data and where that's headed now. Uh, fact of the, ma f the fact that we need to react to a customer really, really quickly, right? If we can have a couple of minutes from each one of you, I think we only have about five minutes left. George? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so when it comes kind of real-time kind of segmentation and analytics, that's actually kind of key for a business. And every single operator should be looking into it because uh, the operators already acquired the humongous kind of data. The data is kind of mass. So not you can't afford actually not analyzing the data and using it in real time. Uh, so when it comes so for sure, that's kind of actually a must and every operator should look into it. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes actually in terms of the platform and speaking about the singular, we already do the kind of real-time segmentation uh, and like a real-time data analysis and the ClickHouse is one of the kind of actually kind of uh, primary text text used there. And just touching the machine learning part, yeah, machine learning is kind of great to detect the kind of patterns. 
just to forget about the AI and some kind yeah. of sci-fi kind of stuff. Machine learning is ideal for the thing kind of actually the patterns and the thing we can actually really quickly. So and also to train the models, especially for the kind of actual printers requirements, that's not the kind of really uh, kind of actual rocket science. So uh, but the only thing, thing that matters is actually to have the kind of data set. And I guess every single operator out there already has the data set. So everyone should think about actual training some sort of the kind of actual machine learning kind of models to kind of use the data, to mine the data they already acquired. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we already kind of have a few examples and we've seen kind of drastic change in terms of the revenues and customer engagements. The moment you start kind of we are uh, launch the real time bonusing, real time kind of rewarding the clients or the kind of show suggestions, it instantly skyrockets your business. And I'm talking matter of kind of uh, days or even in some occasions, even hours. It's, so, it's something I want to interject on um, yeah. before I bring the same question to Ricardo. You've mentioned something, real-time bonusing. Uh, yeah. Back while I still own my casinos, right? Um, yeah. I, I kept banging on to my tech team as we were developing the platforms and so on about entertainment equilibrium, right? One of the first things I used to say, we are an entertainment industry, we are an entertainment industry, we entertain first and foremost, right? And then the question started arising. Why does a customer stop playing? Why do they change a game? Why do they stop that particular game? Why does any session come to a close? And I'm not talking about deposits, withdrawals, right? But there's so many external factors coming into place, right? Yep. The time on machine, the size of bet, the comparison of bet to bankroll ratio of the, uh, of the, right? Now, one of the challenges we've embarked there was, and, and this was a fantastic chat we, we've had yesterday on, on, on data sets and, and, and preparing the data for, for real-time uh, real engagement. Um, we, it, it is exactly that. Understanding the um, uh, algorithms, the aggregations, the, the, the law of averages in order to prepare the pattern rec recognition in yeah. so, so we can compare the pattern recognition with, with real-time event-driven uh, reactive design. Um, one thing that um, I think was challenging, and I'm quite keen to see how you guys solved it, uh, Tim or Ricardo, um, was reconciliation between historic aggregation of data. So if I'm looking at somebody's behavior patterns, right, the size of deposits or the size of bets or the you know lifetime value then I'm looking through a transaction trail that's miles long. Um, that kind of call would obviously take forever to complete. So, so that kind of data preparation in combination with we need these kind of data points in order to see what's happening right now, recognize that behavior, dynamically segment the player and then activate real-time bonusing. Um, I, I think it's quite quite difficult to resolve that and, and I'm wondering how did you come, uh, come about <coughs> that, that uh, solution? Yeah, I can uh, reply to that one. Sure. Uh, we had like, uh, I mean, it's like a very old uh, uh, achievement engine where you can configure like uh, achievements. Like, I mean, you have like 50, different ways you can configure an yeah, achievement I'm, for I'm any aware. game. Yeah. And uh, the same challenge we have with uh, RG monitoring right mm -hmm. now and AML monitoring. Of course. Because as you said, you cannot go back in history and, and try to like uh, fetch all the information. And we, our RG and AML monitoring is like our achievement system. It's totally real time. I mean, if you flag I mean, a customer for a G problem, it has to be in one minute. You cannot wait yeah. to the day after. Uh, the way we solve that is pretty straightforward and simple. We just <clears throat> store all the data every time that the transaction happens. Everything we need is processed. Afterwards. So you calculate, so, you, so wait, you store raw data and calculate at request or you calculate, prepare the basic calculation. So let's say uh, average deposits. On each deposit transaction, you start building that average and have the average deposit amount as a field or at the point of call, you go back through deposits and average them together. Uh, this no, is on each on, on each transaction. For example, if you have a spin, a transaction yeah. of a bet. For example, so you prepare the data. Basically, you know, you understand the, the corner store calculations that need to be done, right? Let, let's call them tier one, two, and three in complexity of calculations. So you will prepare those data sets in order to be able to 
tap into them at request. Is, am I yeah, exactly. Right? The, the way we do it is like we reply to the game supplier, for example, and mm -hmm. after we have replied to them, then we start calculating everything else. So first, like achievement, RG, AML, everything we need to calculate. I mean, we, we basically aggregate all the data. Incredible. Yeah, this is so. Tim, same? Yeah, and this is um, this is something we do very similarly. Um, we have something that looks a bit like a, a Lambda architecture where you have that slow processing path, yeah. and then in parallel, you have a real-time path that is effectively calculating differences, if you like, from the, from the latest batch data. This is one of the areas where we actually do, uh, we do make use of cloud um, providers. So we have a data lake um, effectively in the cloud and we use BigQuery to be able to uh, basically be able to allocate millions of, uh, of operations against it for a very short period of time. And, and you know, that's a key case where cloud service provision um, is a is a huge uh, is a huge benefit yeah, yeah. in terms of actually you know understanding that data. Um, I you know I wouldn't say we had a big advantage over say Ricardo in terms of understanding the player patterns of uh, of, of any one casino. Uh, and I kind of say that for two reasons. What you know one is you know, we can't and we wouldn't aggregate data across multiple operators because it's not our data to do that. It, it is the operator's uh, data. In a pure white label world where where the operators are on our license, clearly that's something we could do. But, you know, that's the world we're moving away from. Um, but really, I think we also see the operator as the person who understands their players. I mean, that really is, that is what differentiates yeah, the operator. You, going back to what I said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what I said earlier about what differentiates your business, is it your payment platform uh, or is it, you know, your understanding of the clients uh, and the front end? So, you know, we see our job is to be able to get the data in real time and then to give the tools to do something with that data in real time, awarding bonuses, triggering gamification activities, that sort of thing, uh, moving someone up a tier in a tournament. Um, and then the actual sort of understanding, if you like, is on uh, is, is what the operator brings to the to the party. Where I think we do benefit from huge data is actually on the sports side. You know, we haven't actually talked about <laughs> much about sports. Probably. Actually, we haven't. COVID. We haven't had the time. But um, but there, where you're looking at trading data, um, when you're bringing in the data Market from sets. all of the uh, all of the operators on the internet, not just our own clients. Yeah to then construct the the Oz models that's an area which to me is sort of equally exciting in terms of machine learning um yeah. and yeah. so on um and and a place where very much we 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 can you know you you know the history of odds matrix you you, you uh um you, uh, and bet brain you know we are in a yeah. we're in an extremely good position in that in that respect uh, especially yeah uh, and and we haven't we haven't touched it's true we haven't touched on sportsbook on any any particular product vertical simply because of time limitations but yeah especially because it's externally driven it's external event driven so so behavior patterns as a, a in response to the events are incredibly intuitive in in, in extracting the, i mean yeah, i, I very interesting topic. Guys, I call this industry pure information technology because that is what we trade in. You know, as a nerd, yeah. I was a computer nerd as a kid. But you know, what, <laughs> what I work on now is purely about intangible information. Yeah. It's who knows more than yeah. somebody else, yeah, and that's yeah. whether it's who knows more about the next random number to be drawn, or who yeah. knows who's going to win a football match. Yeah. Um, which I think is one of the um, exciting things about this business. We're we're, we're on the last minute, um, so we're running out of time. I want to extract. Um, sort of the lessons imparted from this, right? And if, if we were talking to any solution architect out there right now, either thinking of developing a platform, don't, <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or building or buying a platform, I, I think the key, I, maybe the, the, the key lessons, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, would be one, ensure that the structure of the, da uh, of the data, the structure of the data, the architecture of the data itself, uh, is done in a way that allows for scalability and very f uh, fast speed of transactions. I think Ricardo said, you know, we, we, we need to respond in 100, 150 milliseconds. It's, it's, it's a, um, a world where uh, ability to resolve a transaction, ability to resolve an event is of paramount importance. And I think that isn't driven necessarily by hardware. It is actually driven by the architecture of the tables and the, and the databases themselves, you know. Don't put a char uh, designation on a, on, a, on a transactional table, you know. 
that, 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 that kind of stuff. Um, secondly, as, as Tim has stated really, really well, I believe, the scalability does not necessarily just respond to the scalability of the data itself and the transactional capacity. It is the scalability of the organization and ability to, to adapt to the market movements and changes required. So, so as we grow the team or as you're building something, the team must grow with it and you need to understand the size of the project you're embarking on, right? If we're talking about developing a platform. And if we're talking about buying one or looking into one, then the, uh, probably the agility of, of how quickly something can be delivered should be part and parcel of that request for proposals kind of element, right? Um, and I think the, the, the third sort of lesson that, that uh, I've taken from this is the maturity of the solution itself plays a massive role in its ability to, to deliver an ongoing product where a platform isn't a headache. That's uh, not as maybe relevant to, to autonomous and proprietary platforms like Ricardo, but in case of most customers today that are shopping, I think maturity does actually play a role in terms of how, how many clients you have, what's the proven track record of, of, of transactional processing, and you know, can, you, can you deal with the issues as they arise? You know? Everything else, I mean, I, I keep saying the price is not even secondary. Price is da somewhere down the line in terms of um, importance of the platform provision. Right? Um, I don't know if you guys have any closing comments on this. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed the chat. Um, I think it was wonderful. I, I love talking about this. Um, Absolutely. If, if you have anything to add, now would be the time. I've um, yeah no so I'd like to say thank you actually it's been a, it's been a really good chat and uh, and and I absolutely agree about the, uh, the 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 maturity comment and and I think having built a few platforms now and been through this really um, the expertise is in understanding how complicated it is because it looks simple before you've started um, and knowing the the twenty percent of the requirements that will take eighty percent of the time is uh, yeah. is is the is the real skill. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a lot of people who set out to build a platform thinking it will be easy and and are surprised by the real world. But um, if I have one technical tip, it's really think about how to get rid of the databases when you're designing that architecture. And and it, you know it occurred to me just that a tiny thing has changed in the last few years that has made a world of difference, and, and that's the globally unique ID. Um, as soon as you stop using database serial numbers as IDs and start using just 128-bit unique IDs, you can completely re rewrite your architecture to take that database out, and and that's wow. a huge, huge change. Um, so that's for the for the hardcore nerds. <laughs> no, I like that, man. I like that. That's a really good imparted lesson. George, Ricardo, any parting words? Uh, yeah, I actually fully agree with him on all the points what he said. But then, yeah, uh, what really matters is actually the maturity of the platform and they also the company who provides that platform and the ability to be agile and to adapt and, and actually uh, uh, deliver the kind of product, especially when it went and kind of regulations and jurisdictions come into the picture. And actually, just to continue, kind of actually unique ID, kind of actually talk. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. If you're doing kind of any kind of software now and you need some kind of actually ID that should be kind of unique, that's the way to go. But still, we've seen kind of actually, kind of actually uh, let's say jurisdictions, especially the ones which can actually got uh, recently regulated across the Europe, which to still mandate the kind of actually Guys, the simple ID, the increment. I'm being yeah. told to wind this up because we're rolling into the next uh, next uh, panel. Sure. Yeah, right? uh, just to finish on that really quickly is that, uh, yeah, what really matters is the kind of actual maturity and the experience of the company who provides that. Because when you go out there and you, especially when you try to tackle different jurisdictions, there are going to be some kind of actually challenges which doesn't make any sense. But yeah, you have to comply. There's Very no other good. way. Ricardo, not to leave you out. Yeah. Any parting yeah, words? Keep them in under 30 seconds if you can. 30 seconds. I would say that uh, for me, the most important part is regulation. That's the most important part you need to consider when you do a platform. 
and you need to you need to scale. Yeah, that's in actually true. That's actually wise. true. Yeah. No. So that's that's the only thing I have to. Guys, <laughs> add, yeah. I've I've had a lot of fun. Honestly, I love chatting about this. I hope you've had as much fun. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your contribution. Um, I will catch you soon, hopefully. Um, and uh, have a lovely day.